Good morning, kids. It is Friday morning. It is 1040. It's cloudy and cold. Doesn't feel much like spring. So, but in the words of someone, it is the weekend. Okay. So today we're going to talk about something called Hess's Law. It's a relatively easy concept. It somewhat builds upon what you already know uh, with a little bit of a, of a twist at the end. So basically what Hess's law says, and those, this isn't like Hess's theory, this isn't Hess's, you know, idea. This is a law. So, and we use this quite a bit to figure out different thermodynamic values. So basically, if you carry out a reaction and it can be done in steps, then if you add together all of the delta H values for those individual steps, that equals the delta H over the entire sum of the entire reaction, okay? So there's two golden rules. One that you're already f somewhat familiar with, even though you don't know it, and that's if you reverse the reaction, then you change the sign. So let's say, for example, you, you know that a particular reaction, uh, x plus y equals x, y, so some synthesis reaction, Let's say that that has a negative delta H of 45, okay? Whatever that is. So what that means is that you have a negative delta H, so that means that this reaction is going to be exothermic. So when I combine X plus Y and get XY in a synthesis reaction, I get, actually that's going to be wrong, delta H is going to be negative 45. We're just going to move the negative sign over here. That's how it's written. So it's an exothermic reaction. So if I reverse this reaction and take x, y, and decompose it into x plus y, then delta H is going to equal a positive 45. So this is the same idea that we did with redox reactions. So if you had uh, Ag plus an electron, you would have Ag, and that had like a positive E-naught value. So if you reverse it, and then you made it a oxidation reaction, then you switch the sign on that E naught value, okay? So the same thing is gonna be happening here. So if you reverse the sign, you're gonna switch the sign of your delta H, just like you'd switch the sign of your E naught value. Now, this is <coughs> where it changes relative to how you deal with redox reactions. So here's the big change. If you multiply, get rid of that. If you multiply your coefficients by a value, then you also have to multiply the delta H by that same value. So this is what's different. So like when we were doing half reactions with E naught values and we'd multiply by two or whatever it is to get like the common number of electrons. So let's say we needed like 10 electrons and we multiplied both reactions, one by two and the other one by five, okay? If you dig deep into the archives of your memory to get that common number of 10 electrons lost, gained. And, but we would never multiply the E naught value by that because on this, this is an intrinsic property of the reaction. How much of the reaction takes place doesn't matter in terms of your reduction and your, your E naught values. But when you're dealing with your enthalpy calculations, and the reason that we have to multiply that by that coefficient is because of the fact that that is some number of kilojoules per mole. So this is, this is an energy based upon how many moles that you have. So if you have twice the number of moles, then you're going to have twice the amount of energy that's released or absorbed. Okay? So that's why you have to do this. So the process is going to be somewhat simple. So what I've given you is a simple example. And I'm going to say, okay, here are these two reactions. So if I take carbon and burn that in the presence of oxygen, I can get carbon dioxide. So delta H for this reaction is negative 393.5. So what I've got here is I'm saying that this is an exothermic reaction. For every 
one mole of oxygen or for every one mole of carbon or for every one mole of carbon dioxide, this is how much energy that is released. So this is like burning wood, okay? So in the fireplace, you take carbon, okay, basically what you're burning, and you burn that in the presence of oxygen, you get carbon dioxide out of it, it's an exothermic reaction, we're off to the races. Now, you can also burn carbon monoxide in the presence of oxygen and you get carbon dioxide. Now, don't flip out on this fraction of one half going, oh, Mr. Burkamp, we can't have a half of an oxygen molecule. When you're dealing with thermodynamic data, and, and this will make sense when I give Monday's lecture about called enthalpy of formation. Typically, when you look at, at reactions, you want the coefficient in front of your product to have a value of one. Okay, not always, but typically how this is going to play out. So the reason that this one half is here is I could multiply everything by two and had two. That would be just one, and then I'd have two there. But then I'd have to double up this value over here because I multiplied everything by two. So the reason that typically when you look at thermodynamic reactions, don't flip out if you see a half. It's because we want the coefficient in front of the product to have a value of one. So that's why that half is there. Yes, I know I can't have a half of an oxygen at molecule. I know that. But... It makes this delta H work out because then you're talking about per mole. So this is going to be pretty simple. So I've, I've been given these two reactions, and there might be three or four of them. This just happens to have two. And so what I want to do is I want to arrange them so that I can end up with the thermodynamic values based upon burning carbon in the presence of oxygen to produce carbon monoxide. So... Here's the first thing that you're going to look at. This is kind of like, okay, it, it's a puzzle. So I know one thing that has to happen is that I've got to get my carbon monoxide over on the, over on the product side and away from the reactant side. So right away, I know I'm going to have to reverse this reaction. Now, the other thing about Hess's law, and, and I'm just going to send you the answer key for this. But you have to remember that Hess's law is a process. It's showing that, hey, these are the steps that I go through. So in this case, I'm going to reverse this one, okay? So that would get that carbon monoxide on the other side. And maybe that's all I have to do. So I'm just going to work this in a step, and I'm going to go, okay. So I'm going to take carbon plus oxygen. You would CO2. And I've not done anything with that. That's still negative 393.5. But I've reversed this one. So now this is going to be CO2, yielding CO plus one-half O2. Now, this delta H, because I reversed this reaction, now becomes positive 283.0. So now, this is like balancing half reactions, where you can cross out things that are on both sides. So I've got carbon dioxide on both sides, so which is cool because... I don't want any carbon dioxide in my overall reaction, so I want that to drop out. Now, I've got my carbon, okay? So that's, that's, I got that going for me. So I've got my carbon, which is what I want. I've got an oxygen on this side and a one-half oxygen on that product side. So I've got a reactant of one half and I've got a product of one half. So this is just like if you remember back when we were doing half reactions and you combine the waters and if you have like six waters on one side and three waters on the other, okay, it would reduce down to three. So we're going to do the same thing here. So I'm going to get carbon. My carbon dioxides have dropped out. I have one half O2 and then I get CO. And then when I add these together, and this is what we're ultimately after, is to add these together, then I get a negative 110.5 kilojoules per mole. So if I burn carbon in the presence of oxygen to produce carbon monoxide, it's still an exothermic reaction because I have a negative delta H. But what this does from a lab perspective is that this saves me burning carbon in the presence of oxygen to produce carbon monoxide, and then me trying to calculate the thermodynamic data out of it. 
So if I know what happens to produce carbon dioxide, and I know what happens when I burn carbon monoxide in oxygen to get carbon dioxide, then I can combine them to figure out what's going to happen to produce carbon monoxide without actually doing the data. So now I know, hey, when I burn this, this should be my thermodynamic data. It's an exothermic reaction producing 110 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so that one was relatively simple. So the next one's going to be a little bit more complicated. Okay. So we're going to take, start with the same one this first one, and that delta H is negative 393.5, and then I've got hydrogen plus oxygen, oddly enough, producing water, and that delta H is negative 285.8, and then I can take oxygen and burn it in the presence of methane, and get carbon dioxide and two waters, and that is negative 90.3. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of things that are hidden within this. First off, you all are used to seeing this with a two and a two and, and, and this water, okay? You all are used to seeing it like this. But again, because we're talking about thermodynamic data, this is why there is the one half O2 here and not the two and the two here, because that way we've got this negative two, 85.8. Now, here's the other thing with water. Once you, this will make more sense on Monday, but once you begin to look at thermodynamic data, there's actually two different values for water, whether you have gaseous water, otherwise known as steam, or if you have liquid water. So with water, you have to pay attention to what form that water is in because they have different thermodynamic data. So I'm just beginning to plant this seed now. Pay attention to what phase the water is in. In this case, this is going to be liquid water. So basically, the first one is you're burning carbon dioxide. The second one, you're igniting an oxygen or a hydrogen balloon and you're producing water. And then this one is what you do on the Bunsen burner. You're burning methane. You're getting carbon dioxide and liquid water out of it. So here's what I want to figure out. Knowing all of that, I want to figure out what would be the thermodynamic data to produce methane from combining carbon and two hydrogen molecules to produce CH4. Okay, so I'm going to try and figure out what's going to be the delta H for that based upon this. So again, look at this. First off, I know I've got to reverse this reaction because I've got to get CH4 on the other side. Okay, so I know that has to happen. The other thing is, is that I don't, I don't want any water at the end. So somehow or another, I've got to get rid of my waters because I want those all to go away. I want my oxygens to go away, because I don't want them in there either. So once you kind of figure out, okay, where do I have to end up, and, where do I, and what do I have to start with, that kind of gives you an idea. So right away, I know I'm going to have to reverse this reaction. I know that. So if I reverse this reaction, so I'm going to write this down. So I got my three reactions. One, two, three. So I'm going to start with just reversing this one. So that's going to get me, oh, sorry, my bad. 2H2O liquid plus CO2 yielding 2O2 plus CH4. Now when I reverse this, that now becomes positive 893. Okay, so what that means is if I had liquid water and carbon dioxide and I wanted to produce methane out of this, I would have to dump a bunch of energy into the system. Now, I look downstream and I've got two waters here. So I got to figure I'm going to multiply this reaction by two because that's going to get me two waters that I can cancel things out with. Okay. So we'll stick with that color. So I'm going to multiply this one by two. So that's going to get me 2H2 plus 
plus O2, you're getting 2H2O liquid. Now, I've, multiply, I've got to multiply that thermodynamic data by 2. So once I get that, I get negative 571.6. So it's still exothermic, but because I've multiplied all the coefficients by 2, I'm going to generate twice as much heat, and I'm going to leave this top one alone. C plus O2 yielding CO2, and that's going to be negative 393.5. Okay, so now let's, let's look at what magic is going to happen here. So I'm going to cancel out my two waters. Those are gone, okay? I've got my CO2. I can get rid of that. I've got a total of two oxygens here, which are going to drop out those two oxygens there. Okay, so that's kind of cool. So now if you look at what you have left, I've got carbon plus 2H2 yielding CH4. Now, when I add together all of these values over here, now I still have to add together all of my delta H values. That adds up to negative 74.8, technically kilojoules per mole. So, again, so what this says is that if I can find a mechanism that allows me to produce methane gas from carbon and hydrogen, two hydrogen molecules, to produce CH4, that reaction is going to be exothermic, and I'm going to release some energy. Which, so that means I don't have to input energy into this thing. Okay, so I will send you the answer keys, and uh, then that'll take care of that. And uh, you, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll be talking here. It's about eleven o'clock. I will see you. Talk to you all in about.